Welcome to this virtual conversation, the long-term decarceration and freedom in the COVID-19 moment and beyond. Uh, this discussion is the second event in the University of Chicago's Race and COVID-19 series, a collaboration between many campus co-sponsors. Um, thanks to all for helping to support tonight's conversation. Um, which is also being recorded as part of a new series of freedom courses hosted by the American Studies Association and will, be, and will be made available on their YouTube channel along with many other freedom courses. Before we get started, I wanted to give a special shout out to our tech team who is doing the behind the scenes work to make this um, remote event possible. Uh, Ravi Randava, Tobias Spears, Sarah Willis, Marilyn Willis, Tiana Payer Pereira, Maya Rodriguez, and Tracy Matthews. Um, so thank you for uh, making this event possible. Um, we do have closed captioning. Um, you do need to turn that on in order to see the captions. Uh, so, I am Alice Kim. I'm Director of Human Rights Practice here at the University of Chicago. I also teach at Stateville Prison, which is a maximum security prison about 30 miles outside of Chicago with the Prison Neighborhood Arts Project. Um, as many of you know, uh, Illinois is home to two of the most prominent single site outbreaks of coronavirus. Um, Cook County Jail has reported nearly 1,000 cases of COVID-19 and Stateville Prison. Um, there have been 225 um, reported cases and at least 11 related coronavirus deaths. So the suffering that we're seeing in this moment is very real. Uh, the crisis um, in our prisons here in our state and really around the country is really hard um, to fathom. We have all heard many horror stories from those who are locked up inside. Um, so tonight, our panel really has come together to shine a light on the pandemic in prisons. Um, we hope that through the course of this evening, we will be able to dialogue together um, and think together about um, this moment um, and beyond. Um, this conversation also builds on an anthology called The Long Term, Building Life, um, Resisting Life Sentences, Working Toward Freedom. Um, and Erica Miners, who is the co-moderator for tonight's program, is going to say a little bit about um, this book and um, also help introduce our program this evening. So Erica, take it away. Good evening, everyone. I appreciate um, folks joining us today. And I want to give a special thanks to Alice, to Ravi, to Tobias, Tracy, and others for all the organizing labor that made this event possible. Um, today, as Alice mentioned, we're using this recent book anthology called The Long Term Resisting Life Sentences Working Toward Freedom as a jumping off point for our discussion about abolition, decarceration movements, and freedom in pandemic times. Before I take just a minute to sketch out a little bit about this project, I want to acknowledge, in addition to some of the panelists, contributors to this anthology, Kathy and Vicki, and my co-editors, uh, Beth and Alice. I want to acknowledge the labor and vision of our other co-editors, Sarah Ross, Jill Petty, Audrey Petty, Damon Locks for the beautiful cover, uh, Martine uh, Whitehead and Aaron Hughes for all their organizational support. And of, of course, contributors near and far like the California Coalition for Women in Prison and Decarcerate PA. And also a deep shout out um, of appreciation to all our inside contributors uh, for your analysis and vision. So the collective that pulled together this project is a part of PNAP, as Alice mentioned, the Prison Neighborhood Arts Project. Um, we're a network of educators, artists, writers, um, inside and outside the prison, who build opportunities for cultural and political change. One side of our work is Stateville Prison, which is about um, 30 miles from Chicago, where we offer workshops, classes, and a degree program. But as important is the work in neighborhoods across Chicago, the exhibits, panel discussions, film screenings, murals, and more that PNAP collaboratively makes possible. 
Our goal is change. Our goal is the collective work to end our reliance on policing and incarceration. So we pulled together the long term, a collection that includes testimony, analysis, poetry, and interview for several reasons. And I'm just going to briefly um, frame those now as a, as a way to think about our conversation today. First, we wanted to center people serving long term sentences in our movements to end our reliance on imprisonment. In this moment, not only are people serving long term sentences erased from mainstream criminal legal reform movements, but they're often rendered invisible in day to day abolitionist organizing. So we wanted to amplify and circulate the analysis of people inside to strengthen our abolitionist work. And second, as feminists who learn and make cultural work alongside those serving long terms, of, um, in prison for people the state considers men. We wanted to build on the idea of long-term sentences. We saw the visitors and see the visitors um, in the waiting rooms of the prison and in every prison, weekly women, right? We know that many sisters and mothers and daughters and lovers also serve a different kind of time. We see also the long-term impact of our carceral state on neighborhoods across Chicago, across New York, across um, LA, across Ohio, disproportionately black and brown neighborhoods. These communities are also serving time. So we wanted to think about this idea of, of long-term and um, long-term sentencing um, to, to build on it. Third, while people serving long-term sentences in prison or death by incarceration as a contributor to this book project, Decarcerate um, PA, Decar Decarcerate Pennsylvania, um, describes it uh, as death by incarceration. They're one clear manifestation of our carceral and punishing state. We know that many, many others are serving different variations of long-term sentences people on public registries, those released from prison but denied access to social assistance benefits or the right to parent, uh, migrants and many more are also serving a different kind of time. So how to highlight these other forms of long-term punishment. And again, finally, as feminists, we also recognize that centering people serving long-term sentences surfaces important and necessary questions about the long haul work to build responses to gender and sexual violence. In order to end our reliance on, hetero, on the heterogendered and racialized state violence of policing and imprisonment, we must also work to end gender and sexual violence. The two can't be separated in our book. Therefore, the long term is an abolitionist feminist engagement. So intended to be a tool to deepen and grow movements, an invitation to dialogue. We don't have all the answers, but we have some. Um, the long-term resisting life sentences and working towards freedom invites readers to learn, engage, and practice together. So that's a little bit of our I'm going to turn it back to you, Alice, for our um, introduction round. Thanks so much, Erica. So um, we have asked each of our panelists to introduce themselves to you with a lightning round um, sharing how they came to this work. So each one of our panelists, panelists will share one minute introductions of themselves and we will start with Beth Ritchie. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Erica and Alice and everyone else who put this exciting evening together. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Beth Ritchie and I teach at University of Illinois at Chicago, UIC, and Stateville Prison through the PNAP program. I think it was about five years ago, um, after working for over 30 years uh, on behalf of Black women, gender nonconforming, and non-binary people who experienced the horrific consequences of gender violence, um, more often than not, that gender violence led them to uh, being incarcerated, their criminalization. Uh, it was at that time that I was invited to Stateville Prison as part of PNAP to teach about sexual, physical, emotional, spiritual, economic abuse and violence from the state. Um, I thought I was uh, invited there to teach, but really I was invited there to learn. And I'm really excited to share some ideas about what I've learned at Stateville Prison from my students. Um, the reciprocal kind of learning relationships we've had, the ways that they've brought kind of life to some of the things that I uh, study and teach about and I'm an activist on and certainly my teaching at UIC and activism around gender violence and understanding of structural oppression, uh, commitment to abolition feminism has been deeply inspired by that work at Stateville. Happy to be here tonight. 
Thanks, Beth. Next, we'll have Kathy Boudin. Kathy, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for putting this panel together and also for doing the book on long-termers. And uh, it's great to actually be on the panel with actually know everybody on this panel. So that's actually really nice also. Um, yes, I, I work as a co-director of the Center for Justice at Columbia University. And I got into this work because I was in prison for 22 years. And, uh, you know, I was at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility in New York State. And I, when I came home, I had a commitment to really continue my life in a way that was going to connect to the women that I'd left behind, many of whom were long-termers, very long sentences. And I ended up doing work for a while, both in healthcare, working in a hospital, working with teenagers with incarcerated parents to help them go to college, uh, working on developing a program for long-termers inside that would give people a chance to reflect on their lives and and look at the, the, the harm that they had caused, but also look at their lives that had led them to that. Uh, and ultimately I came, and also I'm connected to the issue of, of incarceration now through family. Uh, uh, David Gilbert is in prison serving 75 years to life and our son, Chesa Boudin, uh, was just elected as a San Francisco uh, district attorney. So family is very much connected to me as well. Um, but I think I came to, Columbia University about 12 years ago with my colleague Cheryl Wilkins, who I had worked with in prison, both of us being incarcerated together, with the, with the, with the vision of how do you engage a university in taking on the issue of mass incarceration, multidiscipline. We knew that universities had been sites for uh, social, social uh, justice involvement in over many generations, and we felt like mass incarceration was something that could be really engaged by students and faculty and maybe make a difference. We also knew that it was a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary issue, and that the academic environment in order to make a difference had to connect to the community that was deeply impacted by it. Uh, whether they were formerly incarcerated people, whether they were people who were family members or loved ones that had people in prison, or whether they were activists that had been doing work for a long time around this issue. And so our dream has been to engage Columbia through connecting to the community, through bringing people who have been formerly incarcerated to become teachers there, to engage in projects. Uh, our work is, my work is around, uh, around women, is around long-termers, and in all of these situations, we connect to com community groups with the notion that it's working together and combining the wisdom from these different situations that we can make a difference. Thanks, thank you. Thanks so much, Kathy. Next, we'll have Eric Blackman. Hello, you all. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I would say that my journey uh, into this realm started about two decades ago when I uh, was wrongfully convicted of a crime uh, and spent uh, nearly the entire 20 years in prison um, before being exonerated almost two years ago. Um, since I was exonerated, I've been um, advocating just to speak uh, for those that are still languishing in prison. And, and just to speak about like all of the injustices that I see uh, both through the criminal justice system, just as well as the prison uh, system. Uh, I currently work um, at uh, MacArthur Justice Center, which is one of uh, the best civil rights uh, law firms we have here in the nation. Um, and we basically take a strong approach towards helping those uh, wronged by the system. Uh, I also am part of the Posing Human Rights Lab, where we get a chance to speak out and, and do things there in regards to uh, long-form incarceration and justice and long-term sentences. And I'm just happy to be here and a former PNAP student. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Eric. Uh, next, we have Vicki Law. Hey, everyone. Thanks for being with us tonight. Um, I am a freelance writer that focuses on the intersections of incarceration, gender, and resistance. Um, I got into this work because in high school, a lot of my friends joined gangs, dropped out of school, got arrested for gang-related dumb things, uh, went to jail, got sentenced, went, to, went upstate to prison. 
uh, fast forward a few years, I went to college and I started looking at what post 1970s prison organizing looked like, what happens after the liberation movements have been decimated by COINTELPRO, what happens when there's a rise of mass incarceration, when the rise of mass incarceration starts and we have Reagan and the war on drugs and what does prison organizing look like in this context. And everything I found in my research when I looked at prison stuff was about men. Now, if we look at the work of Beth Ritchie, if we look at the work that Kathy has been doing, we know this is not true, but at the time, this is not what I was seeing on any of these bookshelves or in any of these uh, you know, articles about what was happening and what was defining prison resistance and prison organizing. So I asked myself, what are the women doing? There were not quite 100,000 women in prison yet, and I didn't think 90,000 something women were all sitting on their hands and accepting these terrible conditions. So I started reading and researching, and then I started writing because it seemed like other people were not doing this. I mean, obviously people were, as you know, Beth and Kathy were doing for much, much longer than I was, but I wasn't seeing this. And so this is how I got into this work, and this is just how I continue to do this. And today it's amplifying the efforts of uh, currently and formerly incarcerated people through a gender lens and what they're doing around conditions of confinement, as well as challenging the whole punitive culture and system. Great, thank you, Vicki. And now Ruben Miller. I'm, I'm so glad to, to, to be here with you. Um, my name is Ruben Miller. I, I teach at the University of Chicago in the School of Social Service Administration. And um, I'm just very pleased to be on this panel with uh, many of uh, people who I consider um, heroes who've done such wonderful um, and important work uh, in, in helping us to move beyond um, thinking about people with criminal records as risks. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll come back to some of this. Uh, but but so, so my route into the work uh, started in, in 2003. It, it started a little while before that, but certainly in 2003, I was a, I was a religious volunteer. It started as, a, as, a, as an ethical commitment. I was a volunteer chaplain at the Cook County Jail and I did that from 2003 to 2008. So the height of mass incarceration, I was in the largest single site jail facility. Single site, of course, not, you know, everybody on the panel knows that. You know, um, there are larger jails with multiple sites, but largest single site jail uh, facility in the country, uh, certainly at the time. Um, and, uh, and I was just struck by how many people were moving in and through uh, Cook County that looked like me and how many of those folks were from my neighborhood. So I grew up in Chicago, South Side, low end, um, broke, was born after 1972. So I'm a part of the, the quote, mass incarceration generation, I suppose. Um, you know, that was the year that mass incarceration begins in earnest. And uh, so many people were from my neighborhoods. I run into them at the store, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and I was interested in, 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 in how and why this was the case and, 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 and what we could do um, about that. And so I went off to graduate school to study uh, the experiences of mass incarceration and, and how people experience changes in law and, 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 and social policy. Well, during the, the time I was doing this work, this, uh, and so for the last you know, 15 or so years, I've been following people released from jails, prisons, and uh, police station lockup facilities uh, in Chicago uh, in, in, in Detroit, primarily some folks in New York, some folks in other cities. But during the course of this work, my brother gets incarcerated because I was born poor and black after 1972. And during the course of that work, I met my father and learned he had been incarcerated for 20 years. Now that may or may not have explained why he wasn't around, I don't know. Um, I write about some of this in the book that's coming out in, in, in February. Um, but the point I'm trying to raise is that, you know, I was directly impacted by it, I think, directly impacted, meaning my family is impacted and I experienced it in that way. Um, and I studied it not because my family was impacted by it. My family was impacted by it because my family could not escape it. You can't be born Black and poor in a city like Chicago or New York or LA or Detroit or any of the other ones. And, and not be impacted by this. And so anyway, that's my route in. And um, I'm pleased to be here to discuss what's happening in this country now. Thanks so much, Ruben. Okay, so we're gonna start by actually asking Eric to talk about what is happening inside Illinois prisons. Um, I know that you're in touch with people every single day. Uh, they're communicating with you, they're reaching out, they're sharing what is actually happening. Can you, can you share with all of us what you're hearing from folks inside? Um, well, the state is currently on a uh, um, statewide lockdown uh, with uh, meaning that the guys are locked in their cell with little no time out. Um, they're 
no visits, no recreation, no showers, um, little to no access to the courts or any other thing um, that's going on. Most importantly, um, they are not able to social distance in the confined uh, areas that they are in, and they have little to no access to PPE, and we're hearing a widespread uh, lack of uh, adequate health care and text, uh, testing for COVID-19. Um, I'm also hearing about a lot of people who are being sick, just being shuttled from one place to the other, or not being separated uh, from the general population at all. And people are also getting sick at, at exceptional rates there. Um, one of the highest uh, places that I hear from people from is the Cook County Jail, where we seen that being one of the um, highest single uh, like uh, sites of uh, COVID-19 uh, positive testing. And within Stateville, which is one of the prisons that have one of the highest testings there, we're hearing about uh, quite a few number of deaths of um, young men there. But overall, throughout the state, we're just hearing of just uh, massive confusion, a very, very bad situation where, where guys really have no choice but to try to endure and just hope and pray that they come out of this uh, alive and safe. Thanks, Eric. Um, Vicki, could you build on a little bit of what Eric um, offered and just talk a little bit from your uh, perspective as somebody who's in New York um, and is also a journalist and is also covering what's happening inside like Eric um, and talk a little bit about the conditions for folks inside right now and also what might be same or different um, mm -hmm. because of course the conditions we like to say have always been a pandemic. So trying to think a little bit about what might be the same, what, what might be different. But as what Eric said, it's, uh, you know, like there's a uh, COVID has heightened a lot of the injustices and atrocities inside. So people aren't getting, you know, there's no better treatment, but instead correctional staff and administrations are using this as, a, as an excuse to really clamp down on people. So across the nation, different prison systems are locking people down. Uh, in New York State and Bedford Hills, New York's maximum security prison for women, uh, there are reports that, that women are being locked down 20 to 23 hours a day. Um, in other state prison facility, uh, other state prisons, there's also lockdowns like the California Institution for Women uh, currently is locked down because they have over 100 cases of COVID, uh, I think 70% of which were asymptomatic. So they were having women go to the prison factory and even though they cut hours and they supposedly allowed people to social distance. Once one person gets it, they spread it throughout the factory and everybody goes back to their respective housing units and spreads it. Um, so we're seeing that. We're seeing the lack of visits, which means that it cuts out mm -hmm. what social and emotional support that people can have. And with visits being cut and people being understandably freaked out about their own health, the health of their family, you now have long lines for things like the phone or in some prison systems, they have a very rudimentary email system. They have to line up at a kiosk for, and you get, you know, like you use the kiosk. Everybody uses that kiosk and it's not always possible to wipe down and sanitize that kiosk in between people, just like everybody uses the phones and the phones are set a certain distance apart and it's not six feet apart. So people end up uh, risking their, their jeopardizing their health to make those connections to make sure that their parents or their siblings or their children or their grandchildren are okay. Um, at the same time, you know, we see that in some states, staff members, prison staff members aren't taking precautions mm -hmm. around uh, the coronavirus. I've heard from people incarcerated in Texas, in Michigan, and in Minnesota that guards will be wearing their masks here, you know, or here, or here, you know, like places that don't, that don't matter. And everybody knows that when you are in prison, the way that a virus is going to come in is from the outside. And they're, you know, and they're powerless to really get that you can fuss at some uh, guard and maybe he'll write you up. Maybe he'll ignore you, but you're not going to get him to take the mask and put it where it needs to go. Um, and then finally, uh, coronavirus has also closed legislatures at times when there have been some positive pushes. I recently reported a story from Maryland 
where after 10 years, after 10 years of advocacy, the legislature was poised to uh, pass a bill, which is called the lifers bill informally, which would remove the governor from the parole process for people serving life's life with the possibility of parole sentences. In Maryland, as in uh, California and Oklahoma, the governor has to sign off on parole for people serving life with the possibility of parole. And this would have removed the governor from this process and it would have meant that when the parole board unanimously or major, uh, majority of the parole board recommends somebody for parole, they get parole. Like they've done everything that they needed to do and they get parole. It passed through the house, it had a majority in the Senate before it could come to the Senate floor, COVID closed the legislature. And now that means all these people who might possibly have gotten parole otherwise are now just sitting in COVID filled prisons because the governors again and again and again don't want to be seen as soft on crime. So they routinely reject uh, parole applications from people serving life with the possibility of parole. So we're seeing uh, coronavirus kind of snowball all of these conditions from, you know, like terrible things to atrocious monstrosities. Thanks, Vicki. Um, you know, this whole question, uh, I'm glad you brought up parole because clemency and commutations has become such an important um, thing right now in this moment. And, um, you know, our students at Stateville, you know, they have been, some of them are part of a think tank. Um, others are part of, we're part of organizing um, Parole Illinois and are fighting to bring back a parole system to um, the state of Illinois. Many people in Illinois, including our legislators, um, do not know that Illinois essentially does not have um, a parole system. Um, so Kathy, I wanted to ask you because I think in New York, you've been doing a lot of work around release um, and you've been doing a lot of work um, around uh, people serving long-term sentences. Can you, uh, talk about why it's important to actually center those who are serving long-term sentences. We need you off mute. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, I would love to talk about that. Uh, I mean, people who are serving long sentences, we talk about people serving long sentences using the word long-termer, or I know other places use lifer. I think it's important to know that like one out of nine people in the, in, in, in the prison system are serving life without, are, are serving life sentences. Some are life without parole, some are virtual life, 50 years or more, but uh, nearly half of them are African-American, one, one out of six are Latinx. So there's a large number of people in our prison system throughout the United States that are serving very, very long sentences. Um, now, part of it is, why are they there? Why are they being given long sentences and why are they serving long sentences? They're given long sentences and also they're facing parole denials. So the sentences are, can be extremely longer than what the judge may have given them. The judge may have given them 25 to life, but they may not get out till they've served 38 years, 40 years, 45 years. So the combination of the sentences and the parole denials, why is it happening? This group of people are people who make up more than half the prison system. They're people who have been convicted of a violent crime. And many of them have been, many of the long-termers in particular have been convicted of murder or attempted murder or harm that was really done to people. And it's a very, these are folks who are in many ways excluded from criminal justice reform. I'm sure that all of you have heard over and over again, well, this is for people with nonviolent convictions. This is for people with a nonviolent conviction. And it's come up in the uh, COVID situation over and over again. We can talk about that more, but any of the people that are even being considered for release are people that have what's called a nonviolent crime. The distinction between violent and nonviolent crimes is, is actually something that one could talk about and it's, it, it's not a useful distinction, but why is it important that we center on this? Well, I think first of all, more than half the people in prison are people who have been convicted of violent crimes. So if we simply say, we're not gonna talk about those people, we're, we're excluding people from even thinking about what might really change the system. I think that the first thing I would say is that in doing that, there's a dehumanization, which is tied very deeply to the issue of race and racism. But those people are defined, those people convicted of a violent crime, I was one of those people, are people who uh, are defined as 
as, as thugs or murderers. Uh, even, even President Obama, when he was beginning to talk about letting people out of prison, he, he focused on the fact, I'll let people out that have nonviolent crimes, but not the murderers and not the thugs. And when you freeze people in a definition of what brought them to prison, you're doing two things. One is you're eliminating the whole person that actually committed the act of violence. Why did it happen? Who are they as, an, as a person? And you're freezing them in that definition. So the notion of transformation, change, or growth that happens with time, with aging, with new experiences is also eliminated. So people have, as a large group of people that are being dehumanized by the, the, the issue of uh, violent crime and by the fact that people are long-termers. There's an irony to that, which is inside the prison, the people that are long-termers are usually the people who are the most play a critical role and wardens around the country know this. They're the people who have matured, who have changed, who introduce new programs, who are the mentors for the other people. And they're the people who are able to have found a way to live in prison and give meaning to their life in spite of the circumstances and play a critical role in giving other people hope who come in and are facing long sentences. And when they come home, many of the long-termers play critical roles around playing roles like in, in programs, creating higher education programs, uh, creating uh, programs in battered women's shelters. Uh, um, there are people who are activists, there are people who are playing policy roles. So the long-termers are a group of people, on the one hand, they're dehumanized, but the reality of them is that they're the people who are critical in terms of hope, in terms of growth, in terms of change, both inside prison and outside. I think that uh, ignoring people who are uh, the long-termers also ignores, also focuses on uh, the danger and the fear that they inspire in people and that the narrative inspires. And in reality, they're the people who are the least likely to ever come back to prison. And the statistics nationally show that people who are long-termers are the least likely to ever come back to prison when they're let out. And yet by keeping them in, there's actually the situation in which it contributes to the aging population that's a main factor in, in what's happening in prison. So you have more and more people who are older in prison. So I think that all of these are reasons that it's critical to focus on people who are long-termers in prison and that it's hard to do because people are, uh, exclude, the narrative excludes them from people who should be part of criminal justice reform. I think that focusing on long-termers in prison is something that reveals the essence of our criminal justice system. I think all the work that we do, it's immediate, there's concrete things we need to do, but we're looking at what does it reveal about the, the larger system. And the larger criminal justice or criminal injustice system is based on punishment. The notions that it has to do with public safety, the notion that it has to do with rehabilitation uh, or even deterrence. When you look at the long-termers, they're being held in prison with ex sentences that have nothing to do with whether or not they're gonna be safe when they come home. And even parole board denials in New York State frequently say because of the nature of the crime. They don't even name the issue of public safety. And so it reveals the punitive framework on which our system is built. And I think it also denies the notion of transformation and growth that can happen in spite of the prison conditions. So focusing on the long-termers uh, is both the dehumanization, it eliminates the notion that people change, it reveals the system of punishment that, that defines the system as a whole. And it, it, it doesn't allow the people who have tremendous resources and strengths to come out of prison. Okay, I'm gonna shift a little bit to the question of coming home. Um, you know, Ruben, your uh, work has focused really on the afterlife of incarceration, um, otherwise known as re-entry um, in this moment where um, many people who are working for prison reform um, are calling for um, release. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what we need to be thinking about as it relates to re-entry? Yeah, absolutely, happy to. Um, it's, it's, you know, I, I wanna um, build on something uh, Kathy just said, which is, which is about um, the, 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 um, the rhetoric and the reality not matching um, when it comes to questions of safety. And, and I, I think there's this, this very strange, um, it, it, it's not strange if we think about 
how our world works, but it's, but, it, but it's strange in the logic, this conflation of, 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 of safety and fear, like the, the two things are held together as, as, as if they're the same thing. You can, you can, you can, you can, you can be fearful and take risks, for example, um, with people um, that, 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 that you don't know very well in a situation that is indeed safe. Uh, it, 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 and so when we think about um, the people coming home um, and, and, and the groups of people who are, who are uh, least likely to commit harms are the people who've been gone the longest, they tend to be the people who we're most afraid of. You know, it's kind of the, so, so, so the logic is, is mixed. okay, so, so, so we also govern, I, from, 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 from my view, uh, uh, based on fear, the people that we're most afraid of. And so, and so, and, 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 it's, and, and we lean um, from this position of fear to write law and policy, something like 48,000 laws, policies, and administrative sanctions in this country that target people with criminal records, especially people convicted of crimes of violence, um, from being able to access, um, you know, the goods and services that are available to everyone else in a free society. So, so, so to say some things that are obvious and that are obvious because these are things that we've known literally for decades, that people when they come home need jobs, people when they come home need housing, uh, uh, people when they come home uh, need safe places to be and the full protections of the law. Um, but we've written laws in such a way, we've written laws and policies in such a way that we formally exclude uh, uh, people with criminal records from accessing um, what are otherwise life-giving um, institutions of, of, of the free society. Um, if we think about, for a second, just to, just to think about um, you know, the supposed worst cases. So, so if we think about people who've been convicted of sex crimes, there's nowhere for anyone convicted of a sex crime to live in any major city that I'm aware of. I, 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 I can't think of a single place. Um, uh, I mean, I can, of course, you know, like, it, you know, independent home uh, uh, landlords, you know, with, with giant hearts, there are one or two services here or there, but by and large, people who've been convicted of, of, of sex crimes are overwhelmingly excluded uh, from almost every um, available housing opportunity, so much so that, you know, you, 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 the, 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 the shelters tend to be the place of, 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 of first and often um, last resort uh, for this group, but people who are convicted of crimes of violence more generally are, are turned away by landlords. People who are convicted of almost any crime um, are, 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 are turned away by landlords. In, 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 in this COVID moment, it's really interesting. I, I had a conversation with, 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 with uh, someone who I've been uh, spending time with for the last, I don't know, decade or so. And uh, you know, he's currently homeless because many people who return are housing insecure. And so he's currently homeless. He's, 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 a, he's a, a man who's been convicted of a, of a violent offense and he can't find a place to stay. He's having a terrible time. He lives in a fairly progressive town. Okay, so what this progressive town has done is it's contracted with, with, with people in motels to allow, uh, shelters uh, have contracted with, with motel owners to allow uh, people uh, uh, who, who are living in shelters to shelter in place there um, during 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 this this COVID environment, but 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 there's no access for him. He can't access these these even even the the, the motels that are that are contracted to address um, this time in a pandemic. So so what what my friend uh, is is now doing is shuffling from from couch to couch in the middle of a pandemic. So when we think about reentry. It's, it's, a, it's a really important question. I think we begin with questions of, of, of housing security. Uh, I, think, I think we have to think about the kinds of, uh, not just the fact that of, of whether or not a job is available, but whether or not that job is offering sustainable uh, living wages in, in, in particular in, in the cities in which, in which people live. This, this, is, this, is, this is particularly important. And, and, and another thing that I think often gets overlooked when we think about this population is the population's vulnerability. And so we tend to think about people from rest, especially people who are um, who have committed crimes of violence, as risky, as 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 as, as vectors of risk, people who will harm you if given the opportunity. And, and, and we haven't we haven't in the policy domain been able to shift to think about this group as particularly vulnerable. And this is important because they're vulnerable to all kinds of things because they don't have access to the same kinds of protections uh, that, that people who don't have criminal records have access to. So if the job is already scarce. And you're, and, 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 and you're working on a construct, you, 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 you luck up and get a job on a construction site. 
where do you get put if, if the boss knows you have a criminal record? You get put in asbestos removal with no, <laughs> no protective equipment. So, so in other words, the worst kinds of jobs and the worst possible conditions. And, and, and when you go to lob a complaint, what happens? You're fortunate to have the job in the first place. The legal protections aren't really there for you in the same kinds of ways that they are uh, for people who, who don't have records. So anyway, um, I, I think when we think about reentry, we have to think about fundamental questions of vulnerability. Where do people live? How do they feed themselves? Are they able to spend time with their families? Uh, and, and are they protected um, from exploitation and violation? Uh, these are the central questions I think we, we should be thinking through. Thanks for that. I really appreciate that um, sort of uh, out, uh, lining up how the state engineers vulnerability through banishment laws, through employment restrictions. It's really, really important to keep in mind. Um, and I'm going to pivot and, and ask Beth um, to bring a little uh, feminism into the conversation and talk a little bit about how ab um, abolition, what's the relationship of, of abolition and feminism and the um, maybe the indivisibility of those two. And also, and I know, um, you know, we've had many of these conversations and I heard you talk about this before about, and you were alluding to this in your introduction about, about how teaching inside has um, sort of changed your ideas or made you think about abolition differently or um, opened up new conversations for you. Yeah, good. Um, thanks, Erica and everyone else for the amazing generosity of this conversation. Um, you know, I'm really moved by sort of the seriousness of this COVID moment. Um, and as I do, I'm sort of always reminded to lift up all of the people who just can't even be part of this conversation for any number of reasons, COVID uh, and others. And um, I wanna say first that uh, I learned about feminism and the liberatory possibilities of feminist organizing uh, through work with survivors of gender-based violence. And similarly, I learned about abolition from my work uh, in prisons. And in part, this COVID moment um, represents kind of a death sentence for both groups of people who I work with as an activist. Uh, it's a death sentence for people who experience gender-based violence and are instructed to shelter at home. Um, and home can be a very dangerous place. COVID may be the least of the things that they're worried about. And of course, as other people have said, COVID is a death sentence for people who are already facing death. And so for me, it's the, the opportunity of abolition, learning from what's happening in prisons and other carceral sites and feminism, uh, learning from survivors of gender-based violence, uh, that we have an opportunity for, for something different. Um, so let me just say first a few things that I've learned um, teaching um, at Stateville Prison recently and then other places uh, before that. So I go in and teach courses about gender violence, Black feminist studies, criminalization of sexuality, et cetera. And it's really interesting to teach courses like this um, because um, especially teaching in a facility where the people who are uh, captive there, um, the state identifies as men, I'm hearing kind of this firsthand knowledge about my students about topics from a very different perspective than most of my activism um, has taught me. Um, and it's been um, moving, um, maybe even a little surprising how profoundly and quickly they're able to link up the experiences from the readings and discussions to their own life experiences. I mean, their theories um, make the readings and discussions, um, you know, sort of completely inadequate to what real life has been. So for me, that's the first thing about abolition in teaching these, these kinds of courses, and I would, would argue probably generalizable. The moment you step into uh, behind the gates, you can feel death. Um, and I suspect that many of the people who are um, part of our event tonight, uh, it's not necessary to rehearse what the inhumanity feels like, but I do hope that in thinking about this COVID moment that we are reminded, or maybe different people, more people are reminded about how death is inherent in what prisons are. Um, 
prisons are really like death very much. Um, so the first thing about abolition is we need to find ways that people don't die in these terrible, terrible places and these places that are actually getting much worse as Eric and uh, Vicky talked about. Um, we need, need to demand in a more than just a rhetorical way that they are set free. Um, and that's not gonna be an easy thing to do. But I wanna say equally important are the things that we can learn or that I have learned from the students about life and about living. And this is the part of abolition that's about building things up, not just tearing things down. So there's lots of ways to learn lessons about how to make communities stronger, both inside and out. We've seen incredible um, expressions and activism around mutual aid, for example, in response to the COVID crisis. Um, this is an opportunity to think about abolition uh, around education, building schools and teaching wherever we can. Um, at Stateville, we teach in uh, a school building. I mean, it's hard to call it a school, it's barely a building, but we often get uh, relegated to teach in the gymnasium. And we know that we are not only teaching in those spaces and learning in those spaces, but when our students go back to the other places where they have to find themselves in the mess hall, in their cells, um, on the yard, they're also teaching. And so the lesson is how do we teach, not just at universities now on the outside, but also in streets, gyms, um, like our students are teaching on the inside. Um, there's questions about how to make uh, places like faith communities and social services and um, institutions that provide resources, how to make them really in tune with what reality is. And we know for people who are spending the long term, who are doing hard time, who are spending most of their lives in prisons, they're figuring out how to make things like faith and sharing resources um, and providing support for each other real, setting up systems of accountability, services, et cetera. Um, so the feminist question for me then is if we have figured out how to do abolition work on the inside and we're learning from the inside how to do it on the outside, um, what else do we need to do to have it be abolition feminism? And so here's where I think we have chances to talk about making families stronger and safer. Um, we're learning things in COVID, um, from COVID-19 about how important care networks are and how to have them be better resourced, how to avoid gender binaries and rigid roles so that different people can do different things, caring for children, for example, that so many people are doing differently. Um, how to make gender violence intolerable, how to make relationships, um, whether it's in prisons or activist spaces or classrooms, uh, places where there really is the freedom and liberation that both feminism and abolition uh, can teach us. So for me, teaching about gender violence and race and justice inside has been a good uh, kind of classroom space for me to think about how to do that on the outside. And I think abolition feminism gives us a good pathway to do it. And so that means taking leadership from those who are most effective, affected, making sure we're doing political education, doing mutual aid, all of the things that we see people doing um, now so that they're not dying. Um, and, and we need to not only stop the death, but we need to create places of life. Thanks so much um, for that, Beth. I think that for um, those of us who teach at Stateville, one thing that we have certainly recognized is that um, the classrooms can become deeply transformative spaces and spaces that um, really transform those of us who are going inside, um, not just to teach, but really um, to learn, as you said. Um, so I want to actually uh, urge folks who are viewing this um, from home um, to ask your questions. Um, you can do that using the Q&A link at the bottom of your screens. And for those of you who are watching via Zoom and for those of you who are watching via Facebook, you can ask your questions in the event comments. Um, so as you do that, I'm going to ask the panelists to think about um, a couple of questions and respond to one of them. And uh, 
those questions are, um, what opportunities or challenges do we face in this particular um, political moment around um, reform? Um, the other question is, what organizing is most energizing and transformative um, in this moment? So take a moment to think about that. I'm checking the chat boxes. And if one of you wants to respond to one of those questions, we will um, begin with the questions. Um, we'll intermix the questions with that question. So can I start with Vicki? Thanks so much. Yeah. So looking at the opportunities and challenges that we face, you know, at this time, like there's an urgent need, there's an urgent, urgent need to get people out of jails, prisons, immigrant detention centers, places of confinement. And at the same time, what we're seeing is a pivot by the criminal legal system and the prison nation into ways in which they can continue surveilling and controlling people. So you don't free people, you know, you put them under other forms of control. And I'm going to mess up this quote, but uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about non-reformist reforms. What is the possibility of non-reformist reforms? Reforms that don't make the system bigger and stronger and more expansive. And what we're seeing at this time is the system itself pivoting and proposing reforms or embracing some of these reforms. Like, yes, in Cook County, in Chicago, where many of you know my co-panelists are, people are being let out of jail on ankle monitors. And the county ran out of ankle monitors or people who'd been cleared for release or sitting in jails. Um, uh, you know, like we're seeing like an expansion of or possible expansion of these alternatives to incarceration that are actually more forms of carceral control. So what happens if people are being mandated to home confinement and electronic monitoring because which is probably preferable to sitting in a coronavirus filled jail, prison, or detention center with 25 other people and possibly getting the virus, but at the same time is not. What we want to build is this uh, larger infrastructure that is not going to go away when coronavirus goes away. What happens when people are being sent to uh, mandatory drug treatment centers, you know, in the face of uh, coronavirus? What happens if the alternative to going to prison is accepting some ridiculous probation sentence of 30 years or something like that. Um, so we have to ensure that what we're looking at is not things that might take some of the pressure off that urgency. Yes, you don't, you're not in a dorm of 25 other people, one of whom might have coronavirus and is going to spread it, but you know, how do we actually make sure that we're shrinking these populations so that people don't, you know, so that we don't end up with another battle on our hands to say like, how do we then shrink the prison population and the jail population. Now we have this other behemoth over here and how do we make sure that this doesn't become, you know, our new, like another battle for us to fight. Can I, can I add to that, Alice? Um, thank you, Vicki. I really appreciate the invoking the non-reformist reform because uh, I think that's really critical. And, and to me, there's a whole series of questions about how to come out of this better than we went into it. Mm -hmm. And that to me really is about um, not only how are we gonna save lives, which is critically important, but what are we gonna do instead next time? How are we never gonna find ourselves in this situation again? And to me, that's the abolition question that I think I wanna make sure we keep asking that we need to not only make it less bad, but we need to use this as an opportunity to say, you know, this is a pandemic that has terrified a lot of people. And for many people, it's business as usual. Your lives are um, not valued, you're exposed unnecessarily, then you're blamed for your exposure. And then you're, uh, mili the, there's a militarized response to what happens to you. And that's true of survivors of gender violence who are criminalized. And it's true of people who um, have been in the unfortunate position of exposure to COVID. So how do we say the underlying, the root dynamics that led to this crisis are not new? Um, let's deal with the emergency and then let's emerge uh, not in the same place, but in a much better place than we found ourselves. Um, Can I say something to build on that or would you rather me wait? 
to you. Sure. Sure. Go ahead, Kathy. And then I do have, we have a steady stream of questions coming in. So I do want to get to that, but go ahead. Yeah, I want to, I want to look at the, the, the energizing and the organizing that's happening, because I think that uh, part of what, what I've experienced is, I, I have experienced starting with when I was in prison, the development of community and the community of women that I was in prison with doing work together, doing programs, teaching each other, uh, and taking initiative to make things happen. And the community continued after I came home, both the community of women uh, and a community of, of men. And I think that in the COVID virus, that community has built into an, a much greater national, uh, national community, I would say. Looking at, it's happening both among women in a way I think that's tremendously important. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it, there's the National Council of, of Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls that has national networks of people doing clemency campaigns, but there's also a campaign of uh, for clemency from coast to coast that's happening with that RAP is doing, release aging people in prison uh, with people in California. And there's uh, a task force of women that have been coming together, 50, 60 women in New York, that have been doing taking taking uh, masks and sanitizers and 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 actually tea and coffee to the women at two of the state prisons, Taconic and Bedford, uh, and there's the uh, uh, parole steering committee that has in it now many members of people that are working on legislative advocacy and press conferences and doing what we call in gatherings outside of the prisons where people have died. So I think that there's a foundation that's been built that's being built that is going to carry over into this next period. And I th underlying it, how many of those people consider themselves abolitionists? I think it varies. But I think that under in it is the fact that what's happened in this COVID crisis has, has been to reveal the essence of this system that has to be fundamentally changed. And it relates to the issue of violence. It relates to the fact that we can't solve the problems in our society by prisons. We can't solve the social problems through prisons. We can't solve the health problems in the community by putting people in prison that have health, health problems, that have mental health problems. So I feel like the COVID crisis has raised for us the potential to look at things from an abolitionist point of view and that there's a foundation that's being built that's much greater nationally as well as locally of people collaborating around how do we take these issues on. I don't think it happens automatically. I think there has to be discussion, there has to be learning, but I think that the crisis has opened up the possibility of thinking about abolition in a way that didn't exist before. Thanks, Kathy. Um, you know, I'm glad that you lifted up all of the um, mutual aid projects and organizing that's happening here in Illinois. We've seen similar kinds of efforts um, from so many different organizations. Illinois Coalition for Higher Education on Prison has you know, uh, donated over $50,000 um, worth of materials and supplies to Illinois prisons. Mothers and wives and sisters um, are organizing water to go into Stateville. Um, it's, it's really miraculous um, organizing that and life-saving organizing. Um, I have a question from Holly Krig. Um, who is asking about the clemency process, um, who's asking how we can utilize clemency, um, which relies on hyper-individualized procedures and narratives to release people, to move the demand for mass release of people who might otherwise never get free based on their convictions. And I wanted to ask Eric um, to, to speak to that question. Well, in regards to clemency, um, this day and age here in Illinois, we're seeing uh, somewhat a shift where we've seen uh, Governor Bogoyevich and others never do anything. We are now seeing Governor Prisker make moves to free more people with clemency than we have seen the five other previous uh, governors do. I mean, but that's little to no consolation for those that are still languishing in prison. But what we can do is ultimately uh, flood their desk with clemencies. Um, Parole Illinois has done a great job of promoting people uh, and, and promoting how to ultimately file for clemencies and how people can um, file for clemency and help their loved ones file for clemency in this very trying time. Um, along with that, right now at this point in time, we're seeing a lot of the restrictions or requirements for people to file clemencies being relaxed. 
So this is no uh, one of the best times for anybody to ever uh, attempt to foul it. Um, as far as the narrative, I, I believe that the greatest narrative is just to tell the truth, just to tell about the life of the person there and that this one moment or that one bad decision or one whatever does not ultimately define them. And we're seeing where some people, some may say it's just nonviolent offenders, but we are seeing some people who ultimately hear violent offenses and life sentences be released. And, and I mean, the greatest hope you can have is the hope to keep on going on and to keep pressing on. So with clemency right now, I think it's the best time for people to do it. And I think it's a great chance that you at least have a chance to be heard at this point. I have to say that in New York State, Governor Cuomo has not budged. Mm. He has not moved. And he only talks about releasing people who have nonviolent convictions. And in reality, out of 40,000 people in prison, he's released only 350 people with nonviolent. So I feel like it's been, a, it's been the opportunity to raise the issues and it is a fight. And actually around the individualized issue, I think it is an issue that's been raised uh, that, that you raised in the question. And uh, RAP, which is Release Aging People from Prison, which is the organization I work with, uh, has asked for mass clemency release. Great. I really also just want to add to that, like organizations like Love and Protect and Survived and Punished that have also been trying to straddle this, how do we do individual campaigns, but also see them as campaigns that can illuminate um, widespread transphobia and white supremacy in the system and do sort of mass political education work. So I just want to lift that up into this great conversation, but sort of building from, you know, um, Kathy's point and looking at some of the questions in the chat box, this question maybe is for um, Ruben or, or Vicky, um, kind of building on also Ruben's point about reentry and that complexity of that language, just thinking about all the language that we're working with here, whether it's nonviolent or violent, whether it's the mass incarceration or criminal justice system, how, uh, how and why um, is it important? I always think of groups like critical resistance that are uh, one of their tenants is always like, don't use the state's language or how do, we, how do we get away from that? I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of the ways in which you're thinking about the importance of um, either challenging language in this moment related to COVID and the pandemic or just more, more widely in the work around abolitionist movements. What language is, um, is, is sort of pivotal right now to push back on? Maybe I'll jump in before before Victoria. Um, uh, well, I think I think um, I have been trying to follow the lead of uh, formerly incarcerated activists and organizers who have been pushing me in my own language to think about being person centered in the way I talk about things, and 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 being honest in my descriptions. In my own work, I've been trying to challenge the narrative generally, which I think is overwhelmingly prison focused. Um, and and to, to think about the ways that, that uh, and, and I, th I think this comes from uh, sort of the, the abolitionist critique of how we think about, uh, you know, the mass criminalization, mass incarceration, and, and what we've done is, is to think about um, sort of networks of systems and, 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 and how society is, is, is built. And so, and so what I've been trying to do in my own practices and my own research is push us away from questions of safety and to think really about vulnerability. I think I've been, I've been, I've been very encouraged by um, the public health data that's been coming out um, recently, which has pushed, I think, um, real empiricists to consider questions of things like human frailty, you know, uh, measuring uh, uh, folks' chances at life uh, uh, that, that's, that's showing up not just in um, kind of the activist circles, but in the, the, the really hard empiricist um, uh, social science capital S uh, 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 circles of scholarship. And I think, I think, I think that work I think that work really matters. As far as like shifting our focus away from the prison and more towards social life, this was the the the, the point that Beth raised earlier to, to not just think about um, you know ways to reform the, the mousetrap or something like that or freeing people, but to think about what it means for people to come home. I think that I think that public work journalists like Victoria, for example, um, uh, uh, folks out in the public that are exposing uh, the truth. Uh, as, 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 as Eric suggested, are important. Just one uh, example of, 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 of something that I don't think people 
um, are connecting with incarceration, which is disability. Thank God for folks like Liat Ben Moshe um, at, at UIC and others who have been who have been been pushing this. When I was doing my work in and uh, when I was doing work in Detroit, I followed 90 people who got released from jails, prisons, and police station lockup facilities. There's literally no research. I, I can't find a single shred of data uh, on on police station lockups and, and 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 of things that come out. It's almost always qualitative or descriptive or maybe a policy report. But anyway, so I'm following people largely out of these 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 police station detention centers and uh and i follow people home 90 folks and and what i found was that every single person i went home to either had a diagnosable disability themselves or went home to a family member who had a disability so you've got somebody who's got the burden of incarceration who's locked out of the labor market locked out of the political economy and culture who now has to care for or ask for care from uh, people who have diagnosed disabilities. And I, and I don't just mean mental health disabilities. I mean things like uh, retired auto workers who have fused discs in their backs and can't sleep without pain. Uh, 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 grandmothers who are taking care of grandchildren who have cerebral palsy. You know, every single person in my, in my sample returned to a home uh, in these sorts of conditions. And I think spotlighting the, the, the living conditions of people um, uh, uh, goes could go a long way, has gone a long way. And also to, to add to Ruben's point about language, right? Like there there's, is the importance of language and what it's important to push back on. And a lot of people still use the system's language because that's what they're, you know, that's what they're used to. So a lot of people in prison will refer to themselves as uh, inmates or felons or prisoners. Um, so I think it's important to like, you know, like look at the language that we're using and as a journalist, I push back a lot, you know, I don't use the word inmate, you know, I try to avoid the word prisoner, but like, you know, like I actually, like, you know, like I don't, uh, you know, I don't use dehumanizing language, um, but I also try to look for the, the narratives of like what, you know, like what safety means and what people want. I mean, there's a Huffington Post article today that was written by a woman who had been raped many years ago and it's called, I had to decide whether to recommend my rapist be paroled during the pandemic. And she talks about getting this letter from the parole board that said, you know, this person that harmed you many years ago is going up for parole. Do you do you object? And she, you know, she flashed back to the assault. You know, it was, you know, traumatic. It was, uh, you know, and she said, you know, and she grappled with this this dilemma of like, do I, her, you know, do I do I think that this person will get out and harm somebody else? Do I think this, you know, like, you know, like what is my safety and my community safety, but also there's a friggin' pandemic inside prisons. So also do I want to keep this person in a coronavirus filled prison or a prison that could become coronavirus filled, you know, if somebody like, you know, with it comes and coughs and sneezes and breathes on people. Um, and in the end, she decided that she was going to write a letter to the parole board and just say, I do not, you know, oppose this, you know, you know, whatever the parole board decides, fine. I hope that, you know, he has taken you know, whatever measures he needed to take, whatever classes, programs, treatment. Um, what she also noted is that nothing in that letter said, you know, this person has completed all of these programs or all of these things. There's no indication. It was just like, yes or no. Um, and I bring this up to say like, these aren't the narratives that we often hear. What we hear is like, there are victims and the victims, you know, don't want this person to be allowed out, you know, like, and maybe we hear this because nobody ever tells the people who are harmed, hey, you know, this is, you know, this is what the person has done with their time in prison. They are no longer, you know, that, that person that thinks he has a right to women's bodies. He is no longer, you know, she is no longer that person that thought it was a good idea to hold up a store with a toy gun, you know, and in the process, somebody else gets hurt. You know, these people are no longer the people that they were, you know, in their like, you know, 20s or 30s or teenage years, or, you know, even in their 40s or 50s, like, you know, I'm not the same person I was two weeks ago. So I bring that up to say that's a narrative we don't often hear. And then again, you know, if we, you know, like language matters. I mean, I know that journalists and writers often don't get to choose their own headlines. So if you see headlines on my thing, it's usually not because I wanted it. Um, so, but, you know, like to use the word rapist as opposed to like, you know, like the person who sexually assaulted me. And if we look at just the language that transformative justice and restorative justice movements use, they often talk about the person who caused the harm or the person who, you know, caused the assault. So it's not victim perpetrator, but it's the person who was harmed, you know? So it's not 
this is who you are. You are always the perpetrator. You are always the rapist. It's not like you sexually assaulted somebody, but you might also be an awesome older brother to your, you know, to your kid's sister. You might also be the person that was like taking your grandma to dialysis once a week, but you obviously have issues with, you know, with somebody's personal boundary and consent. So like looking at that as well, like what are the narratives that are not being told about what people who are harmed want and what public safety means and also, how are we portraying them and what kind of language are we using that pops up or doesn't pop up the system? Okay, we have so many great questions that have come in and it's really impossible to get to all of them, but um, I'm hoping that we can continue this conversation elsewhere, that we will all be having many more um, forums, um, hopefully, in real life at some point, um, but also online. Um, but I did, there were a number of people who did ask about what it is that they can do um, in this moment um, to, in terms of organizing efforts, but also in terms of working towards um, abolition. So I wanted to, I don't think we have um, time to get to everyone, but I wanted to ask both Eric and Beth to close us out by sharing um, some things that folks can do um, to uh, work on um, the issues that uh, we have all been talking about today. So Eric and, and Beth. And I'll go first. Um, I think that one of the greatest things that I think people can do is to get proximate, to ultimately reach out and to get a chance to meet and know somebody from inside of a prison or somebody from inside of your community that has been affected by the criminal justice system. Sorry, Lenny, but just somebody who's been affected. I think that at that point, you ultimately end up beginning to change the narrative and to understand that person, their lives, and those type of things. Secondly, I believe that it's imperative that we all reach out to the people that we vote for, our senators and Congress people, to, to ultimately tell them what our thoughts are on this. I look at some of these laws where we're spending nearly $2 billion a year here within Illinois alone, just on incarcerating people every year. I mean, and this right here is one of the, the, the greatest travesties that there are because we would spend $30,000, $40,000 to incarcerate someone, yet we won't give them a grant to go to school or money to live or, or just, just a fraction of that just to survive here. I think that it goes greatly to those measures and those type of things that will ultimately really reach and have some effect. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, Eric, you said it, you know, beautifully. I think it really is about building community, making connection, and really finding a way both to think about how in this emergency we are going to save lives and what we need to do kind of every day, each of us, what can we do every day to save lives, and also how to build the world that we want to see. And for some people, it's how to support people who have the authority and expertise to define what the world should look like. And for other people, it's stepping out there and saying, this was my experience, this is the world that I want. And so I think it's a both and situation. It's save lives and radically organize to build a different kind of world. Um, you know, I think the building on sort of that last question too, I think we also have to get our heads around um, the possibility of redemption and change. And we have to be courageous. We have to take risks. We have to imagine that not only people can change, but the world can change. And how's that gonna happen? Because people change the world. Um, I'm hoping that somewhere after this, there'll be like a list of organizations that people can connect to or um, actions that people are taking. Um, and I think we all just have to step up and do it. Um, now's the time. 
Thanks so much uh, for those, those remarks from everyone. I know folks are coming from busy days and um, organizing work and care and support and mutual aid. So I really appreciate the time and all the smarts and the insights. Um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna wrap it up now, but I'm going to just start the wrap up by saying thank you and just acknowledging all of your labor, all of the work that each of you do in all of your different realms and that this conversation is deeply appreciated. And also just to lift up Beth's point about organizing. So many groups have been listed today, whether RAP or Survived and Punished or PNAP, those organizations um, could of course use your resources, um, your time, um, your, your uh, dr drive ca uh, car caravans or bicycle caravans if they're doing action. So um, I know that in a church basement or a storefront near you, wherever you are listening to this, there is um, a group that's working um, to build abolition, to build, uh, reclaim, as Ruben was saying, different definitions of safety and freedom. So I'm just encouraging people to get connected and plugged in. So I'm gonna turn to um, the fabulous Alice, um, um, who we also owe a debt of gratitude for, for organizing this. Um, to just um, close us out. Um, I just really wanted to ask folks, I've been tasked with the responsibility of asking you all to take a few minutes to fill out a brief survey. So um, that will actually help us be able to organize events um, in the future. You can find that on the Race Center's um, event page. So I will say that um, just and then I will also just say um, this, this panel and this conversation, I think only began to touch on so many of the issues um, that are facing people in prisons and you know, the crisis of incarceration that we're facing. And um, I hope that we will all be engaging in further discussions and further conversations. I think really Eric hit it on the head when he, Okay, I have no idea what that happened, what, what just happened, but just to say <laughs> that all the flukes of Zoom um, events uh, along with, with everything, um, but uh, just to say that I think Eric, um, Eric's point about getting proximate um, to those who are incarcerated, that we all take um, that to heart. And, you know, every single person who is on this panel is involved in uh, different organizations and doing the work. So um, please, um, we will, we will share with folks who registered and on our various um, Facebook pages, event pages, um, resources and ways that um, you can get involved and where you can get close and more proximate to um, the injustices that we're seeing, um, but also um, be able to engage and do something about it. So I, I'm just gonna wrap it up with that and uh, thank all of you for watching and thank all of the panelists for participating.